but welcome. This is a talk called Discovery, 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 the most important part of any projects, and I, it's all about command line. No, not at all. Um, but before we get to anything, I'm Dwayne. I work for Pantheon, and I've got a table out there. I'll talk about them in a second. Uh, I've been in the sales and marketing world since 2005. That's how I've made my living. And I have learned a lot of lessons the hard way. I've also learned lessons formally in schools, uh, in classes, Sandler Technique, and various other people I've studied under. And that's where this talk comes from, is that world, observations I've made, uh, and things. But outside of that, in tech, I do stuff. I like improv. Um, there's an improv talk here. Awesome. Hope you all plan on to go to that. Uh, web comics, comic books, love karaoke. I'm on Twitter a lot. Wow, it worked out well. Uh, please find me out there. If you could tweet this, I left my information right here at the side for you. Um, Real quick though, I work at Pantheon, we're a web hosting management platform, uh, elastic hosting and tools for teams, development sites and all that good stuff. Come talk to the table, we'll give you full demos and whatnot. Uh, quick silly request, uh, if you guys could take a picture of this and someone send this to me, of me standing in front of this picture, that, that would be amazing. Uh, these are the other two times I've talked this year. Uh, I'll give you a second to get that picture, all right. Oh uh, yeah, this guy's over got it. All right, thank you very much. We'll move on from that silliness. Um, and quick question, I wanna know who's in the room. I just told you who I was, I told you where I work. Uh, so what's after lunch? This is the second session after lunch. You're all in that coma. The coffee hasn't really kicked in yet. So everybody, let's wiggle out a little bit. Just, you don't have to get up, but just move, move your arms around a little bit. And uh, then at the count of three, just yell out your name. One, two, three. <laughs> and where do you work? One, two, three. And where do you come from originally? What's your hometown? One, two, three. Oh, there you go. That feels better. I feel like we know each other now. Really, is one place, one time, doing a thing. Uh, but quick show of hands, uh, who here is a developer for a living? Awesome. Who here considers, considers themselves a designer for a living? Who here considers themselves a business owner for a living? And who here needs a website made? <laughs> ha? All right. Uh, if anybody raised their hand about website making, there's a lot of other people here that are designers and developers, as you saw. Um, but honestly, who here came to this talk because they saw the name and thought I was gonna do something like this? Developers, 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 developers. I yes. love that talk. Bomber didn't do a lot of good things for the world, but he did that, and all you need to know about uh, discovery is this. Um, that's a lot of questions. We don't need to get into those yet. We'll come back to that. I do have that same passion for discovery based on years and years of doing sales and project management process. And it really all boils down to, to this. We need to be, have the expectations match results. And yes, for those graphic people in the room, yeah, this is a little ugly, but did you expect a sales guy to make the prettiest slide? Maybe it fits, maybe it doesn't. Um, but it's all about aligning the expectations with the results and delivering people what they're actually asking for, what they actually think they're paying for. Because when we don't, it is tragic. Uh, yes, this is a yellow cake with an eyeball on it. Is it what they ask for? I doubt it. I seriously doubt it. And as we all know, when people don't get exactly what they want, they get cranky. And cranky people are awful to deal with. Um, she's not so bad. But a client calling you, a customer saying, this is not at all what I signed up for, I want my money back, or now we need to do all this extra work, it's just an awful feeling. So how do we solve that? Well, I think it boils down to this, discovery is the most important part of successful projects. We all know most of these words. I'm gonna get into discovery. That's really what today's talk is about, obviously. But I wanna stop for a second and think about what a project is. Because we say project a lot, and we throw that word out, and that means a lot of things to a lot of people. If we go back and look at definitions, this is just a random definition I found online. I like the fact that it requires a lot of time, but it's specific purpose. And I love etymology, I love where words come from. And it's actually throwing something forward, that we are aiming at a thing. 
we are trying to hit, in fact, a goal. Every project has a goal in mind. You don't do projects just to do projects. You don't do a sales process just for the heck of it. You do a project to get to a, or a sales process to get to an endpoint, a goal, a specific goal. Is it a good goal or not? Well, that's a completely different talk. That is a completely different set of things in the world of how do we set these goals and how do we know that it's a measurable, attainable thing. That's not really what today is about. Today is about this process. Who here has never seen this before in their life? Not this slide, but this idea. Okay, there's a few hands, and everyone else is on some other understanding of this, so let's just go through this really quick. This is a project funnel. Let's divide the entire world into boxes that all funnel into each other. So I can say everyone in the entire world is a potential lead for WordCamp Phoenix, but then they got people's email addresses and they qualified you in to say, yes, you actually wanted to come here, and then there, you did a discovery of, well, can you actually attend? Uh, are there sessions you even wanna see? Uh, oh, there is, well, that's this proposal process. It's really short, it's just a ticket screen, and then there's a procurement where the process clears, and then you're in delivery and you're here. Uh, if everyone in this room, I got your email address and I treated you as a lead, I could qualify you to see, do you want my services uh, for some of the stuff I do in my life? If you do, we'll go through a process. And it works mechanically the same way every single time. We go through a process. We take leads and we qualify them. Again, not the point of today's talk. It does feed into everything else I'm talking about because we don't want to do a discovery process with people who can't pay us. We don't want to do a discovery process if there's not an actual need there, if there's not a timeline involved. Why would we bother wasting our time with figuring out what to deliver if they can't meet any of these things? That's one checklist, Bant. Um, I learned Scotsman, uh, Sandler technique. Uh, they all do the same thing. It is a mechanical, very quick checklist to say, can you pay me? Do you have the authority to pay me? Do you have a timeline in mind? Uh, can I even do what you're generally asking? If you come to me and ask you to build you a skateboard, I'm the wrong guy. Uh, if you come and say, uh, I want you to teach an improv class, I can do that. And we can qualify and further discover from there what to do. Again, not the point of the talk. But if we don't qualify properly, we'll waste a lot of time doing discovery with people that we probably shouldn't have. So just keep that in mind. When you do discovery, step back and say, should I be talking to this person in the first place? Should this process be going forward from here? Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is I need to qualify it a little bit more. Qualification can take a few steps, like a few calls. Uh, there's an old saying in sales, get me to yes as slow as it takes, but give me a no immediately. And that's what I want. I don't want to waste my time and I don't want to waste yours. But we're going to talk about that next step, that, that process of discovery for the rest of the day. And it does go back to goal setting. It goes back to these smart ideas, uh, these smart goals, that we want to have a specific thing we're delivering we want to have a measurable result. So six months after the project is done, they can call up and say, yes, we have succeeded, or no, we have failed. And here's exactly how I'm gonna prove that. Here's the KPIs, here's all the metrics. Today's not a KPI talk, though. How do we get them to tell us what they want? If they could just tell us, I want this and this and this, in the first place, they wouldn't need us. Honestly, if they knew how to get to where they wanted to go, they'd have already been there. They'd have already gotten there. They wouldn't need a consultant, an expert, an advisor to say, here's where you are now, let's get you to the next phase, where you want to be. But what people can tell you is big ideas and rough sketches of where they want to be in the future. But much more importantly, they can tell you where they're at right now. And if they can't tell you where they're at right now, that's not a good sign. If they can't tell you how their business fundamentally works, if they can't tell you how their team's put together and how they function already, maybe you can solve that. Maybe you want to be in the business of business consulting. It's good money. But know that that's what you're doing, that you are no longer on a project. You are a business consultant doing something utterly different. So how do we get this information out of them? How do we get them to tell us their dreams and where they're at today? We get them to tell us their story. Fortunately, human beings think in stories. 
fundamentally true. There's a, a quote from Lisa Kron, who's a um, cultural anthropologist, who uh, said, if opposable, if opposable thumbs taught us to hold on, stories told us to what, what to hold on to. Um, this predates language. Uh, the story does. It's the fundamental construct of how humans communicate. Quick example here. Everybody go like this real quick. This isn't some kind of symbol. This is just a thing. Um, and now everybody put your fingers on your chin. I said chin. The actual spoken word, the actual language part of our, our language is about 7 to 9%, depending on who you ask. It's a fragment. It is a very, very, very small thing. Understanding the whole context of a thing and that story is much more important. I like to think of stories as in this model. There's a bunch of ways to think about stories. This is what I learned uh, going up through improv classes and theater. Uh, story spine. Every story you've ever heard in your entire life goes something like this. Once upon a time, there was a thing. There was a world that existed. And every day, there's this pattern that happened. But one day, the pattern broke. And because of that, a series of events happened. And because of that, another series of events happened. Until finally, there's a resolution to that change event. And ever since then, there's a new reality. That's every episode of Scooby-Doo, Gilligan's Island. Uh, every movie you've ever seen in your life is some version of this. Um, uh, Memento is backwards. Um, it, I think it maps to a really nice sine wave or partial sine wave, math geeks, excuse me for misusing your term, um, that goes something like this, where you have a reality that's going along, going along, going along, all of a sudden there's a change event. Something has triggered it, and because of that, there's another series of events, another series of events, and another series of events, until finally we reach resolution, and then a new reality exists. I firmly believe that if we're gonna do projects, sales, anything, with a client that gives us any kind of money, we need to have them explain that far end deeply. How does this work today? What's going on exactly? How does this world exist today? And why am I talking to you? What's the change event? What's because, but one day? If they don't have those things, why am I talking to you? Like, well, you need a business consultant if you can't explain once upon a time and every day. And if, but one day, there's no trigger event. They don't know any of the rest of this except this beautiful piece, which is where they want to be. They want to be able to sleep at night knowing this. And they can tell you that. It doesn't have to be realistic, but they can tell you it. And if you can map between here and there, oh, that's, that's a project defined. That is a goal written down with a date. You can make those dreams come true. Let me give you a quick example of how this would work in the business world, because I see some faces are like, what's does this have to do with business? One day there was a shoe company, or once upon a time there was a shoe company, and they sold shoes online. And every day they could handle about 1,000 orders. But one day, they got 12,000 orders and the system broke and a cascade failure happened and everything went offline. And because of that, they realized we need a better system. We should just improve the one we have. Because of that, they realized that their current way of doing things was not completely scalable and they went on a hunt for a better vendor. And because of that, they realized their requirement set didn't actually match anything off the shelf, and they needed to custom build and order this thing. Until finally, they hired a development agency that built them their new system, leveraging off the shelf tools and parts, and they could handle 10x the traffic. And ever since that day, they've handled up to 100,000 orders a day just fine. That's the story of Zappos. Or any other shoe company that sells shoes online these days. Um, Notice how the part where they hire a developer and they do a bunch of work is the very last piece? Your story is not their story. You are a small component and a much larger story for anybody you ever work with. Not to slight your work at all. It's an important part. It's an exciting part. But unless you step back and see, oh, I am part of this whole thing. There's a world that existed before I got here. There's a world that will exist after I leave. There's things that happen that I have no control of over. There's things they tried before I got here, and those failures are gonna influence the way they treat me and the way that they work together. For those of you who develop or do any kind of project management, how often do you ask, 
So tell me about your last failure. When's the last time you failed doing a project? How did that work out for you? Nobody, that's a crazy question. How many ask, well, what was your experience like working with a previous developer? You've worked with other developers before, right? You have? Great. What was that experience like? Go details for me. It's not a common question. It's a discovery question. I, a kind of thing I learned was ask, have you bought something like this before as a salesperson? Have you ever gone through a complex sales cycle to buy enterprise Java middleware? No? Well, let's explain how that's gonna work then. Because this is a process. This is not a transaction where if I wanna sell you this bottle of water, you say, yes, I want a bottle of water. You give me a dollar, I give you the water. We're done, that is the entire transaction. I'm not talking about those kind of sales. I'm talking about bigger things, bigger projects than that. It all comes down to asking questions. How do we map that? How do we get all that together? Is we ask a bunch of questions, which gets us back to this crazy list. Again, questions don't matter. We'll get back to that. Not that questions don't matter, they really do, but they're not necessary to write down at this moment. Before we get to that, we wanna talk about some ground rules. Some things that will be universally true in every discovery process from here for the rest of your life that were beaten to me by vicious VPs of sales and people that taught me this stuff. If at all humanly possible, you wanna do this face to face. Now there was a period of time where this was not 100% possible, but we live in the world of Zoom and Google Hangouts for what it works and Skype if you're really in a pinch. How's this meeting going? Anybody? How's this meeting going? How do you know it's going good? What's that? Yeah, smiling. That guy looks a little concerned, but she's happy. So this meeting, I think, is overall going well. Now, if we close our eyes for just a second, if you close your eyes, uh, I'll put up a new slide. Uh, how's this meeting going? I didn't change slides, everybody. Um, the same meeting, it's going great. Uh, but you don't know. There's visual clues. Again, the actual verbal part of our communication is a fraction, it's a very small fraction. Nonverbal communication clues, that's how we evolve. That is how our brains process dealing with other people. Is micro, one of the things that makes humans very unique is we have more fine uh, twitch motor uh, control over face than any other thing on earth. We can control our face at a very, very fine grain level and we have adapted over a long time to be able to pinpoint, see, oh, something's wrong. Or that's great. So if at all possible, see their face when you're talking to them because there's a big difference between that's a good idea and that's a good idea and that's a good idea. Those are the same words but three completely different responses. Moving on, we need to ask open-ended questions. This is actually pretty straightforward. There's only six ways to start an open-ended question. Anybody know what they are? There's only six ways. Yes, yes, all the W's and the H. There's only six ways to op uh, answer or ask an open-ended question, and they all start with this. One of these words. Maybe not grammatically perfect, they have to start with this, don't think that's a grammatical rule I'm giving you as a question writer, but the difference between the first, uh, the first one and the second one there, um, the person who signs off on this, no. And then they just stare there and stand there and look at you. I don't know how many times that's happened to me in my life, where like, are you, is the answer this, no? All right, well what is the answer? As Carl Sagan always says, if we can eliminate a step, let's eliminate the step. Let's, uh, let's get rid of it. So who signs off on this? You're gonna get a different answer. Asking someone specifically, like do you want this on the left page, side of the page, and they're not 100% sure what page layout even means, is a much different answer than like, where do you imagine seeing the pictures when you log in? When you get your page, where do you imagine this looks like? Very different answer. And then a yes or no. Of all of those questions, I am firmly convinced from all my experience that the why matters more than anything else. The who's important as far as getting budget, uh, the what, well, that's the bigger picture we're talking about. They don't know the what. They know what they're trying to get to, 
but they do know the why. If they don't have a firm why, you probably don't have a project, quite honestly. If there's not a reason they're doing a thing, they're never gonna do a thing. Asking the why will expose the bigger business problem, the bigger issue they're actually trying to solve. That it's not just, I want a new website. Nobody wants a website. They want the results of the work of a website when people visit the website and do something. So figuring out what that is, is asking the why. Why is this important to you? Why is your company even doing this in the first place? If they don't have a good answer to that, it's not gonna be a good project. Further on the why, every single person you talk to in a process is a person. Every one of us is motivated by completely individual things. Every single one of us has um, a selfish desire to preserve our lives, further it, improve it, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. That is just being personal. That is a per being a person. So if you can connect, and this isn't universally true of every project you'll ever do, but if you can connect it, the why they want to do a thing to a personal reason, it carries so much more weight. I'll give you an example. I'll give you two scenarios here. Um, the first scenario, if I don't get this project done, my bonus this year will be 2% less. Is that person motivated to buy? A little bit. If I don't get this project done, I will lose my job and my kid won't be able to go to college and I'll be homeless in the next six months. Is that person motivated? Yes, they're gonna be on board. And if they're signed off and they're with you, they're gonna fight, they're gonna champion all the way through because that person is gonna lose their house if this fails. Again, that's an extreme example. But if you can connect to something personally, like, this is my business and I have to do it better this way because, well, you know what, I want to build that extension, I want to go on vacations. That's why when they sell you timeshares, they ask those kind of questions. They want to tie it to that personal need. Ground rules. Listen way more than you talk. I like a 75, 25% rule because you do have to talk. You have to lead the conversation. But don't dominate the conversation. You want to ask them, this is their phase. In qualification, talk about yourself all you want. Once we get to procurement and proposal, you're all, almost 100% gonna talk about yourself because you're gonna explain exactly how you're gonna do the thing that they told you they wanted done back in discovery. So if you're not, uh, the person that speaks, ah, let me sorry, rephrase that. The person who speaks the most in a sales conversation loses every time, no exception. Next time you're in a sales conversation, just stop and let them talk and Half the time, you can let them talk themselves out of selling you the thing, or they'll talk you out of buying the thing if they talk long enough. Get to a yes and stop talking. Or resist talking about yourself. Again, you'll have a whole chance to do this later um, in the process. Because if you do this, that client is gonna go, oh, that person's not listening to me. Because how many people have ever answered the phone and heard, I'm blah, 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 from blah, 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 and I'm selling blah, 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 and your business, blah, 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 blah. That's the most annoying thing in the universe because you don't know who I am. I know you're not listening to me. There's no way you can help me because you don't know me. You don't know my situation. You don't know what I need. In discovery, it's all about setting them up to talk about themselves. But that's unusual a little bit. Like to sit down and interview someone and say, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions and I'm going to ask you for real to answer. That's not 100% an intuitive process. So set up some ground rules with them. Let them know what this process looks like. They don't know, maybe they do. Uh, this is I randomly Googled person pointing, a guide pointing directions. This came up and I've always liked this picture. If I ever go to Gettysburg, I'm doing this tour. Because uh, I feel very confident that this guy knows where I'm going. Because I go down that street, then that street, down that street. I know where to get to in this tour. Unless I'd been to Gettysburg and had done this before, I wouldn't feel confident going. But now this guy's showing me the process. Oh, I can do that. This is, again, if you've asked him, have you ever bought something like this before? Have you ever gone through a process like this before? Have you ever worked with a developer on something like this before? Oh, you haven't? Let's stop and explain how this works. Because you're gonna get confused, you're gonna get thrown off by things, and you're gonna panic, and when you panic, I'm gonna get angry emails and calls. But if you know it's coming, you'll probably still be feeling an email, but it won't be as frantic, it won't be as crazy. I like to give people freedoms when I'm explaining my expectations. Like, this is how this should work, but don't worry, you have a lot of freedom in this thing. These are the ones I always use. 
Um, you can answer any questions I don't know. You don't have to know the whole world. You don't have to boil the ocean here. Uh, you can say, I don't know, but I can get back to you. That's a great answer. I love that answer because you're going to involve other people in the process and we're going to get to a right answer. Uh, it's weird to talk about personal stakes in business. It just feels weird. It's not. We're all people. Give them the freedom to do that. Uh, freedom from reproach, that you're not going to go back to their boss and like, you're never going to believe what your employee told me. Your department head has no idea what they're doing whatsoever. No, no, honestly, you, your freedom from reproach. This is me and you having a conversation, and we're going to figure this out together, and we're going to partner up on this. And the last one's my favorite one. Uh, I've always phrased this, not as you have a freedom to dream. That sounds really big. It's like, here's a magic wand. In six months, what does this all look like? What's your world look like? Here's a magic wand. Don't worry about the how or even if it's possible. Just what does your world look like in, in six months if we're happy? The freedom to dream is huge. Being transparent is super important. We only buy from people we trust. Or if there's no other options. Comcast. <laughs> um, I buy Sonic in San Francisco, by the way. Uh, but transparency 100% leads to trust. Let them know up front, like, hey, I'm in this to make money as a developer, and I want to help you with your business as well, but here's all my expectations and goals, and here's how it's all laid out. And if you're true to that, your trust will only go up over time, and when push comes to shove later in the process when something does go off the rails, because it will, almost always, somewhere along the line, they'll be like, I trust this person because everything else they've ever told me was on the money. I have no reason not to trust them. And if you're transparent from day one, that's super easy to gain. It's a process. But by the end of Discovery, you want to have all your questions answered, all of them, by each of the stakeholders in the group and the group itself. If you're dealing with a single client, this is super easy because it's one person. If you're dealing with a committee, you need to go in and actually interview them all and figure out what's going on with them. And you want to have your questions thoroughly answered before we get done with the Discovery phase. Discovery's not the end of the project, it's a part of the project. And no, it's not 100% locked down. If you need to come back and rescope something later, know that you need to do another scoping exercise and a new discovery process. But to know that you're done with discovery means that you are ready to sit down and write a proposal and all of your questions are answered. I fly a lot. Last year, about 120,000 miles in the air all, to, all in. Uh, and one of my favorite things to hear in the world is, uh, Prepared doors for um, all call, or prepared doors for cross check and all call. Because that means we've landed safely and the flight attendants are getting the cabin ready to go. And we are gonna open the door any second now and I'm getting off this plane. Nobody died. Hooray. And I know that because that's the very, very, very last thing on the flight checklist. There's the pre-flight checklist, the flight checklist, and then the post-flight checklist. I don't care about the post-flight checklist. The flight checklist, the last thing is like prepared doors for all call. Our unarmed doors, or whatever it is. Um, you should have a checklist. You should know, like, I am done with this process because I got to here. All of these things happened. Which leads us back to our questions. Not a bad list of questions. I Googled project management question examples. This found this URL. It's not a bad one. But it also found 80 others on that same day, and this is just the one I picked. These aren't bad questions. And if I sat down and went through a methodical, methodical process, every single time with this set of questions and fine tune it for my customers, I would find success. Is it flawless? No, there's people are people. But having a fine tunable process makes all the difference between super angry customers that hate you and won't buy again and people are like, yes, I am with you and partnered on this and we're in this thing together. So I'm being told I have one minute. I didn't manage my time well with this at all, people. So uh, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time for questions and conversation, but I will be out at my table. But I do have time for one or two. Yeah, let's say we're a little behind schedule, but um, uh, uh, questions. Or observations, yes. Yeah. What are the hardest parts of negotiation and how do you resolve them? Uh, over in the Drupal space, uh, there's a talk that got really popular last year. It's retired now called uh, Project Management the Musical. And it has this wonderful line in it. Um, uh, uh, 
uh, just a spoonful of research helped the stakeholder calm down. Helps. <laughs> Uh, it's all about getting those data points early before the money's on the table, before there is uh, that process, uh, before you get push comes to shove in negotiation of saying, hey, remember your kid's not going to college if we don't do this? Hey, remember these data points you shared with me and that these metrics don't increase? You know, your company's going to make 20% less money next year. Remember that? That's what we're doing here. If it doesn't bring that value, then probably they shouldn't do it. But if you can prove on paper, hey, the versus by this proposal, these are the results, and these results are exactly what you wanted, why are you now saying that wasn't what you wanted? Do we need to rediscover? Do we need to rescope this? The answer sometimes is yes, that the money's just not there. Sometimes it's like, well, yeah, we can do this for less, but then we can't do these parts. So let's just cover up those lines. We'll deliver all of this that you want, but not these parts. Is that fail proof? Probably not, but that's helped me in a lot of complex sales of just going back to that discovery and the research I did early. And one more. All right, I'll leave you with this then. Um, uh, two things. Uh, first, you all have more knowledge in your head about individual discovery processes and real world experience in this collectively than I could ever have in my lifetime. So talk to everyone else here. It's WordCamp. Everybody's here friendly and happy to share their thoughts and feelings on this stuff. I am not the subject matter expert of anything in the entire world. I'm just the guy that submitted a talk that they let do this. So hopefully you can all have a conversation yourself or maybe write your own talk if you just have some better points in here. But very lastly, just because it's on video, if you all could just indulge me and let's get a discovery, 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 discovery. Discovery! 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 Alright, that's good enough. Thank you!